welcome to unit three, lesson three. So as usual, you're looking for the tasks to complete for U3L3. You can find it either under assignments or on the Science 2 campus homepage of the weekly calendar for Science 2B. Today's date is the uh, 18th of November, so you can find it there on the Science U3L3 plan. As usual, we'll start off by <clears throat> getting into breakout rooms and sharing our answer to a silly question. I'm gonna throw the question in the chat right now. Question is, if you were a superhero, hero, what would your superpower be and why? You guys haven't answered this yet, have you? No, okay. Think about it for 20 seconds. Points for creativity. Don't forget to say hi and check in with the person you're in the room with as well. We'll come back together in two minutes. Rooms are open. Uh, all right, thanks a lot for sharing. Uh, next on the docket was to check homework. Uh, only two, well, three things you had to do, which was submit a photo of your notes, but then you just had to make sure that you completed the Climograph worksheet part one. You're actually gonna do part two today if you have time. Um, but this looks great looking at the stats. Uh, looks like everybody got through this just fine. And then the reading reflection, um, seeing, oop, let's uh, filter for your section. This is B. But again, looking good on multiple choice, seeing 14 attempts. And um, just want to chat about the last question here. Forgot to pull up the image of it. But um, which hemisphere, northern or southern, does most of the human global population live in? Anyone know? What'd you guess, northern or southern? Northern? It is indeed northern. Does anyone know why? Uh, is, it, is it because there's more land? Yeah, there's way more land. Uh, I encourage you hop on Google and look up like map of Northern, map of the Southern Hemisphere, and it's crazy. The Southern Hemisphere, we don't think about it, but it's literally the Horn of Africa, uh, a little bit of South America and Australia, and that's pretty much it. Uh, whereas like Northern Hemisphere has all of Eurasia um, and North America and some pretty big population centers. Um, so it's not surprising that the human population in general tends to think of like January and February as winter and June, July, and August as, um, as summer because we're all in the Northern Hemisphere, which is how that lines up. But people in the Southern Hemisphere experience the exact opposite situation. Any other questions or comments on the homework or anything you want to look over? Um, I had a question about, um, okay, like the Southern Hemisphere is like majority like made up of water um, or like the ocean so and then i read somewhere like the ocean like absorbs absorbs like a great percentage of heat and mm -hmm. so like and then later like exerts that so i was wondering how and then i was also reading like that the southern hem hemisphere was like the coldest region um even surpassing like antarctica technically mm -hmm. um so i was i was kind of like wondering i don't know like how does that work is well, it Sorry. Yeah, it, well, no, it makes sense, right? It, it actually makes sense because um, ocean water is actually usually reflecting a lot of the uh, warmth coming from the sun, right? So it kind of bounces right off, like a, think of the ocean almost like a giant mirror. Um, but also, you have to think about water. Um, so from anyone's experience, if you've ever like made pasta before or anything like that, does water take a long time to heat up or does water heat up like super quickly when you put it on a stove? Like do you have to wait or does it like boil instantly? What do you think? Anybody? You have to wait. Yeah. Water has what's called a high heat capacity. So Emily, um, ocean water in particular is very good at absorbing warmth while not changing its temperature. So that's the weird thing. That's what you mean by high heat capacity. So um, ocean water will, as you said, it absorbs a lot of that solar radiation, but it, it doesn't change its temperature dramatically. And therefore it keeps a lot of the air that's above that ocean pretty cold. And so that's why I think you see lower, generally lower temperatures in the Southern Hemisphere. It's the same thing why, why um, where I am here in Pebble Beach, we tend to have much more temperate, colder weather because we're constantly getting air coming off the Pacific, which has been cooled down, right? It's been being kept cold. Whereas like if I got in my car and drove to Salinas, it would be almost a completely different temperature because um, you've got the mountains blocking those cooler winds coming off the ocean and it's much warmer inland, even just a little bit more inland. Um, and so we're going to cover some of this later on in the chapter, but I think that's what you're getting at is that the, the ocean is kind of like Earth's air conditioner. And so it's, it's keeping that southern hemisphere cool because there's a lot more ocean surface um, over there. I don't know. Did that someone answer your question? 
Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll keep exploring a lot of this. Um, the reading you're going to do tonight, actually, for homework, we'll, we'll touch on a lot of this, too. So that's a good observation. I'd never thought about the average temperature difference between northern and southern hemisphere and, and how the, the greater abundance of ocean kind of contributes to that. So, yeah, good point. Anything else on homework people want to share? All right. Uh, I'm just going to review the images from the reading to make sure we're feeling good. And I've got a couple poll questions that I'll throw out to you. So bear with me here. Just bring it on my iPad. I'm going to close my tabs here. So just give me a verbal confirmation. Everyone seeing radiation and uh, greenhouse effect in front of them? Yeah. Yes. All right. So this is a diagram we'll spend a little bit more time on when we get into light, which we're going to do in relation to electrons and chemistry later in the year. Um, but just good to observe that. Think of light as um, energy in the form of a wave, right? You've got long wavelength on one end and short wavelength on the other. That's kind of the key distinction. And so you can see the names. We've got radio and microwaves and infrared and ultra x-rays and gamma rays. Um, so does anyone know what type do you not want to be exposed to very much? Is it kind of on the long, the long wavelength side over here or the short wavelength side? Look at the examples. Does anyone know? Very good, you want to avoid short wavelengths. Yes, gamma rays, x-rays. Uh, if anyone's ever been to the dentist and gotten an x-ray or for any other reason, uh, you might have had that giant like lead bib put on you. Like they put this like metal thing over you uh, and it's meant to protect your major organs from the x-rays, <laughs> which can be pretty damaging. Uh, whereas like on the other end, radio waves, you guys are being exposed to radio waves all the time. If you have a radio in your house, if you live like on our campus where we've got KSP, uh, KSPB, which is emitting radio waves, they're not dangerous. They bounce off your clothes, they bounce off buildings, they're not gonna penetrate anything. Gamma rays can do that. Now, humans, we think we're pretty evolved. Our eyeballs in particular are pretty amazing when you think about how they work. But in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is what you're looking at here, can we see a broad spectrum of light or only a little bit of light? A little bit of light. Yeah, it's kind of pathetic. Look at that, that's the visible spectrum right there, that's it. A lot of insects and stuff can actually see into the ultraviolet and infrared. In fact, there's some cool images you can look up on Google um, where you can expose flowers to ultraviolet or infrared light and they actually have entirely different patterns on them that we can't see, but insects can. It's pretty cool. Anyway, so the whole point is to emphasize that ultraviolet right here is um, technically a high energy uh, form of light. And so uh, let's now look at how this light arrives on our planet and delivers warmth. Uh, you filled in these percentages as part of the homework, but I think the key point to take away from all, all the solar radiation that's arriving on our planet, 50% of it, half of it is absorbed by Earth's surface, which is kind of interesting. Um, not quite, I was expecting that it was being absorbed by the gases in our atmosphere, which happens a little bit, but half of it again is just going straight into the ground. And then it's being re-emitted in the form of infrared waves, right? So you've got this visible light coming in here, much higher frequency, higher energy form of um, solar radiation absorbed by the earth and then re-emitted in infrared form, which are these uh, wider wavelength, slower waves. And this is where a lot of the warmth comes from. And so again, not surprising then that we have relatively warm, stable conditions close to the surface of our planet. But if you start getting higher up in the troposphere, like climbing Mount Everest or whatever, uh, it gets a lot colder. Um, because you're sort of away from this uh, emission of warmth from Earth's overall surface. So this was something that I hadn't really kind of wrapped my mind around before, that it's actually uh, warmth radiating out of the soil. So it's almost like, think about like a tarmac, right, in the sun. The, the tarmac's actually what's absorbing a lot of the heat and emitting it out, and you can kind of see that, that wavy appearance sometimes if you ever look at the horizon where there's a tarmac, and you can, you can see the heat coming off of it. Uh, so this contributes to what's called the greenhouse effect because these ultra warm, these kind of warm um, infrared waves get trapped in our atmosphere very similarly to how a greenhouse works. So a greenhouse is kind of like a little glass building where um, you can raise plants and things like that. And if you've ever been to one, they tend to be very warm on the inside. And that's because uh, visible light is able to come through the glass and uh, strike the plant. But then the ground, the plants, and everything else are re-emitting, just like the surface of our planet does, this lower energy, um, uh, I keep forgetting if it's infrared or ultraviolet, uh, infrared light. But that can't escape through the glass, right? It gets trapped in there. Uh, and so it heats up that space on the inside. 
And this is sort of what's happening to our atmosphere. Now that's a good thing, right? We need the warmth, but um, the gases that do this, right? CO2, water vapor, methane, um, we as human beings are starting to ramp up the production of these more than you would naturally see. And so that's why we have what's called global warming, um, where too much of this infrared um, warmth is getting trapped. Okay, quick poll question for you to try. Should be visible on your screen now. Give that a go. Okay, seeing 13 out of 15 responses. Give these last two people another 10 seconds and I'll reveal. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. All right, looks like we're feeling all right. Um, again, this was a bit of a confusing question, but uh, the most direct transmission of warmth into our atmosphere, again, is technically coming from the ground, right? That the earth is absorbing this warmth from visible light from the sun, and that is what's immediately warming up the gases around us. Though, you're right, if you selected the sun, that is the source of all warmth on our planet. Um, and human activity is also definitely ramping up the greenhouse gases, which are these gases, again, that are very good at trapping a lot of this uh, warmth in our atmosphere. So none of you were really wrong with that, but good to see most of you are catching on that it is indeed the actual surface of the Earth that's emitting this warmth, which I found really interesting. Okay. Quick review of longitude and latitude. I'm hoping most of you are familiar with this already. Longitude are the lines that go north to south, right, from pole to pole on our planet. Um, this drawing is actually a little bit inaccurate. Um, the prime meridian, which is the zero degrees right here, should actually be going through England over here. I don't know why. They're a little bit off in their drawing here for some reason, or I mean, maybe I'm making a mistake. I'm pretty sure that's, that's where the prime meridian should be. Um, latitude is all related to the equator, right? So the equator is kind of like the belt around the waist of Earth, and then you can either go north or south of it. Um, so everything's measured in degrees north or south for latitude, and degrees south or e west or east for longitude from those prime meridian and equator lines. And again, the whole point is just to kind of create a little cross-hatching grid where that you can then use to sort of pinpoint any location on the surface of our planet, which you did a little bit with the climatograph exercise and you'll do again today. What's cool is that we can actually look at latitudes and there are some general trends with climate in these different latitudes. And it makes sense, the equator, which is exposed to the most direct uh, light and solar radiation coming from our sun, uh, these tend to be tropical environments. Um, there are, again, are always some exceptions, uh, but these tend to be very warm. Um, temp temperature doesn't fluctuate very much. The amount of sunlight they get throughout the year doesn't fluctuate very much. And then as you move north and south, things get start getting colder. Uh, that's because, again, the sun isn't coming in at a direct angle. The atmosphere starts filtering out a lot of the visible light, which then um, means there's not a, a, as much warmth for the gases to absorb. And so this is kind of a good trend to keep in mind, right? That's why you've got tropical, temperate, and polar regions. However, in reality, it is a little more complicated. We're going to learn about how wind and ocean currents can contribute to this. And uh, in a second, you'll see that Earth's rotation also tilts, and so that changes things a bit. Uh, so we were looking at climographs before. You're going to do more work with climographs today, but I like them because they're a nice little snapshot of the overall conditions in certain places. So it's kind of cool to compare something like Kazakhstan, which is, I would say, more towards the temperate zone versus Chad, right close to the equator, versus Australia, again, more in the temperate zone, but in the southern hemisphere. And you can see that um, in Kazakhstan, for example, you have huge temperature fluctuations, uh, but tends to be very warm in June, July, and August, and colder in the what we think of as a winter months, December, January, northern hemisphere. Um, Chad has a much more stable and generally warm overall temperature, whereas like it's cool to look at Australia, tends to be warm, but it gets colder in June, July, and August, and warmer in January and December because it's in the southern hemisphere, um, so their seasons are sort of reversed. Then, so look at countries that are closer to the equator, like India or Tanzania, Look at that, there's like hardly any temperature fluctuation throughout the whole year, right? You could have one set of clothes and that's all you wear um, the whole year round. You might have to dress differently, especially if you're in India for the rains, right? Here's the monsoon season, look at that, uh, how much rain they get. Um, 
versus exact opposite in Tanzania. But there's some interesting things going on there with um, cloud formation and stuff too, which we'll look at in a little bit. Anyway, and then the polar regions get really extreme. So you can see it's super cold in Antarctica. And again, reverse seasons, right? It warms up in December and January and it gets really, really cold in June, July, and August. Uh, and then the, Ar or, sorry, the um, Arctic Bay in Canada is the opposite. Again, generally very cold, but warms up in those same, what we think of as summer months. Uh, and so seasons are caused by the tilt in Earth's axis. That's why we have summer and winter. I used to think it was because in summer, Earth rotated closer to the sun, and in winter, we rotated farther away from the sun. But that's not actually true in terms of Earth's orbit. It's more just like which hemisphere of the Earth is tilted towards uh, the direct sunlight. And so Earth is tilted at a 23.5 degrees. Uh, that's what it's rotating on. And so um, if you slice it in half, here's our northern and southern hemisphere in both cases. Um, when the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, this is when we have longer days and much warmer. So this is what we think of as summer. And then when it's tilted away from, uh, so here you can see that kind of tiny sliver right there. This is when we have shorter days and it tends to be very colder. That's our winter. But it's the exact opposite for the southern hemisphere, right? This would be summer for countries in the, or continents, any land in the southern hemisphere. This would be winter, as we were emphasizing with those hymographs. And so we have different names for these, right? And you've probably heard a lot of these, like the uh, summer solstice, longest day of the year for the Northern Hemisphere. Um, that's when we're tilted towards the sun, you get the most sunlight. Summer solstice, shortest day of the year, right? That's when we're tilted away from it, don't get very much sunlight. We're on our way to the winter solstice now, that'll be in uh, December around Christmas time. Um, anyway, so kind of cool to see that that explains the seasons. One more poll to throw at you, should be on the screen now. Give that a go. Okay, seeing 12 to 15 responses. Let's try to get at least one or two more. Give it another 10 seconds. Okay. Here we go. Looks like we're feeling good. So uh, the lines that run north to south are indeed longitude. Um, I don't think of them, I mean, they're not longer technically, but that's what I think about is like, it's really long from the North Pole to the South Pole. And so longitude and then latitude is just the opposite of that. All right, any questions or comments on that quick review of what you read? All righty. Then your activity today is going to be to make a climograph for a location of your choice. So we are on step number four, the tasks to complete list. Uh, you're going to click on this assignment here, making your climograph, your local climograph. It'll take you to this assignment. Just like with the Bob Gardner ascent graphing exercise, please take the time to read each step. I try to be as thorough as I can with the instructions. I also have a demonstration video that I made uh, right here. It's about five minutes long. Uh, but what you're gonna be doing is opening up this website called timeanddate.com. Uh, and it should pull up a climograph for your local locations. So like my computer knows that I'm in Monterey. Uh, so it pulls up the Monterey climograph. Again, notice there are little blue columns here on the bottom and very, very low numbers. Shows you it doesn't rain very much here in Monterey, right? We get mostly fog. Uh, and then these orange bars are showing the temperatures. The blue numbers on the bottom is the minimum temperature on average. The number on top is the maximum temperature. I'm gonna have you guys calculate an average of these so that we're only working with one temperature number. Um, you can search for any location up here in the upper right corner. And um, I encourage you to, again, you can do your local environment, but I also don't wanna look at 25 different climb graphs of Monterey. And so if you've got another location, maybe where you have family, maybe where you visited before, or you're, you know, something else you've experienced or another location, uh, by all means do a more diverse location. Uh, I was doing, as an example, Bangor, Maine. So you can type in almost anything in here and it should pull it up or any, any place that has an airport is going to have, um, Climograph information. Uh, and if you ever get lost in this website, just remember we're under weather, look on climate, it'll take you to that climograph site. What you're gonna be doing is then opening up this template Google Sheet, and the usual deal, 
instructions are also written in here. So you don't have to click back and forth if you don't need to. And your goal is to fill in this table here on the bottom. Uh, you're going to look at the graph and enter the precipitation numbers from the columns on the bottom. And then the lower numbers on those weird orange bars, the minimum temperature, and then the upper number, the maximum temperature. And then I've already entered an equation in here. It'll automatically calculate the average for you once you have entered those numbers. Uh, before you can edit this though, as usual, you have to go to file, make a copy, please delete the copy of name and type in your name and then location, whichever place you chose. So like I went with Bangor, Maine, uh, and then create that. If you're doing this correctly, you should end up with something that looks somewhat like that um, for graphing. And again, I have uh, steps to walk you through the graphing process. Yours, again, will be different, though, based on the location that you chose. Once you have created your graph and shared your Google Sheet through this assignment, I have instructions on how to submit it here, uh, you're going to open up this quiz here, Local Climate Graph Data Reflection. It's just a, another Canvas quiz with four questions where you then have to reflect on the graph that you made. Any questions on that right off the bat? I will be here listening if you need help. I'm happy to get you into a breakout room too. You can share your screen with me. Uh, I'm gonna time for 20 minutes to work through this and then we'll come back together to kind of reflect and check in. Go for it.